Hello and good day to all my viewers. Welcome to Bangladeshi's Beyond the Borders, a twice monthly interview series from the Business Standard, where we meet all the Bangladeshis who have gone out into the world and achieved greatness. My name is Asaf Zapata, and I'll be your host today as we speak with the esteemable Professor Tahir Saif, who has recently been invited as a member into the prestigious National Academy of Engineering, the highest professional honor in engineering for his work on mechanical properties of materials at nanoscopic scales. Dr. Saif, it's a pleasure and a privilege to meet you. Thank you so much for coming today, and I look forward to speaking to you. To begin with, you began your studies as a civil engineer in Buit. How was your journey going from there to becoming a, uh, uh, beco uh, to entering theoretical and applied mechanics in the University of Illinois? Right. So I studied in civil engineering in 1984 when I graduated from civil engineering. And then I uh, spent two years at Puet, teaching at Puet as a lecturer. And then I came to uh, Washington State University studying civil engineering to get my master's. And then I went to Cornell uh, University in 1987. And that was uh, to do my PhD. So I finished my PhD in uh, theoretical and applied mechanics. Uh, it's a field in between engineering and applied uh, mathematics. Uh, so much more theoretical. Uh, and then uh, um, I wanted to do my postdoctoral work. Uh, that was in electrical engineering. Um, that was from 1993 to 97. Um, so I was looking for a job uh, and was not getting many offers. Uh, but finally, I ended up in University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, in mechanical engineering. So uh, even though it looks like civil engineering and then applied mechanics or uh, theoretical and applied mechanics, electrical engineering, mechanical, uh, in a way, you know, from outside, they look like all different engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some underlying themes, concepts, uh, some physical laws that are followed in all these engineering disciplines. Um, so that's what I learned along this journey uh, that um, you know the basic principles are not that different. Uh, so I never studied mechanical engineering although I'm teaching mechanical engineering uh, at the University of Illinois. So that's the principles that same principle that I have been applying in all these fields. Yeah. Interesting. So what exactly sparked your interest in research in mechanical engineering at such nanoscopic and small scales? You know, this is uh, it's a very good question. So I, I think in, uh, as you know, as we all know, uh, life is always through coincidences. Uh, we do things that uh, we never plan that much ahead of time. Um, so, so what happened is during my postdoctoral work, I came across with a few interesting questions or some interesting people who were doing things at very, very small scale. It's uh, called micro-mechanical systems, so micro-electro-mechanical systems, MEMS. Uh, so it was a very beginning stage of microsystems. You know, as you know, today's uh, airbag sensors in cars are routinely used. We have sensors all over the place and uh, they're very, very small mechanical sensors. Uh, so during 93, 94 time, it was the early stage of these microsystems. So I got very fascinated by it. I thought, you know, I don't know what job I will get. In fact, I was thinking I will not get any job because it's a new field. Uh, who's going to give me a job even, even if I get trained? Uh, but it was so fascinating that I just hooked up into it. Uh, so I spent four years understanding the basic principles of these nanoscale, microscale systems. Um, so to answer your question, just sheer excitement. Um, no particular motivation of getting a big job. In fact, with the prospect of get, being jobless, uh, I thought uh, it would be interesting to work in this field. Uh, so after graduation, um, in the US, the top universities always look for expertise which are in the horizon. So there are few places where I could apply because they were trying to get into this field and University of Illinois was one of them. So I was just lucky to get this job. And once I started mechanical engineering, I started getting more and more uh, into microsystems and nanotechnology. 
Is this connected as well to your work on biohybrid robots, which I know as well you have become well known for? Yeah, that's another coincidence. Uh, you know, in the microsystems, most of the nanotechnology is used for physical sensors, like, you know, airbag sensors and um, mostly for modern modern cars and computers, they're loaded with these physical sensors. We cannot see them, they're too small. There are hundreds of them. So, as I mentioned, life is about coincidences. So, when I was working on the small systems, sensors, one of my colleagues, whom I didn't know before, he came to my lab. He is in embryology, where they study in vitro fertilization uh, in animals. And of course, doctors use it for, uh, for human beings. So he came to my lab and he said, uh, I need your help. Uh, he wants to test embryos before they're implanted uh, so that he can identify which embryos would be successful. Uh, as you know, in vitro fertilization, is about 25-30% success rate uh, for women, and it's a very emotional challenge if it doesn't get successful. So he was trying to improve the success rate, and he said, you have small mechanical sensors, can you test them? Can you check if the embryo is very, very soft, or is it very hard? Maybe we can, we can distinguish between good embryo and bad embryo before implanting. Uh, so, I thought it's an interesting problem if I can help someone uh, using my microsensors because embryos are very small, uh, you cannot see by naked eye. But uh, so I started working on this. Uh, after six months, I realized that uh, there is no distinction between good and the bad embryo in terms of mechanical behavior. Hard or soft, they're all hard, but they're all soft. Uh, so I kind of got frustrated and. Uh, his name is Matt Wheeler. I said, Matt, don't, I don't want to work with you anymore. Uh, <laughs> I spend all this time and I, I cannot find any difference between them. So there is no mechanical signature between good and bad. Uh, so before I was leaving, that was the first time I did bio, uh, mostly to help others in case I, I can provide some help. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, so I was kind of leaving the field and then I uh, wrote uh, an email to, at that time, was a very well-known professor at Harvard. His name is Don Ingeber. And um, he was writing more about the biomechanics, uh, very, very early stage. And I wrote an email to him and I said, Professor Ingeber, I don't know you, you don't know me, but uh, I, I know you, but I, you, you don't know me. Uh, from his papers, I got to know him. I said, I did these experiments, I find nothing. I'm about to quit this field, do you have any advice? And he responded in one line. He said, uh, you need to pluck the right string, uh, whatever that meant. And he said in his, towards the end, he says, P.S., I'm sending my postdoc to your lab in three weeks. He will tell you. Interesting. So he sends his postdoc in three weeks later, he comes and he explains that you have to take out the shell of the embryo to test the cell, living cell inside. Um, so from that point on, Don Ingeber keeps asking me, you should come to my lab to learn more biology. So I go to Harvard with my student, spend days there, and since then uh, he had become my mentor. And I, I got, got more and more into biology <laughs> using the same small sensors. That is fascinating. Um, for our audience, would you mind giving us a sense of scale of what does nanoscopic biohybrid machines actually mean? Yes, yes, good question. So our hair is about 100 microns, which is one, uh, one tenth of a millimeter. So if you think of a scale in a millimeter scale, uh, which is already very small, one millimeter. So it's one tenth of a millimeter is our human hair. So if you take a single hair, your eye has to be very sharp to see it. Uh, our sensors uh, and biohybrid systems are like a little bit more than a human hair in the total length. Uh, or, so, so they are kind of long tail. Uh, the width of the tail is one tenth of the human hair. So you cannot see by naked eye, right? You have to use good microscope to see it. So, but they are long, long in the sense they could be one millimeter. So they're really small, one millimeter long and one tenth 
the milli, uh, one hundredth the uh, one, hun one hundredth of a millimeter. So one tenth the size of the human hair. So that's the size scale of these little machines. But the ideas could be in the long term future, one can think of sending them into the body in large numbers uh, to do whatever they're designed to do, right? or to take care of environment, or even to do drug testing, uh, right? So there could be many, many of them. Right? It sounds like you're on the leading edge of a new field. Um, how do you see that your work in these biohybrid robots and other nanoscale technologies will help people in Bangladesh? Yeah, actually, I, many times I, I uh, talk to people in the Buet. So these, are, these technologies are very cheap. Really, it's very inexpensive. Uh, so, for example, to build a lab with uh, pretty much everything that I told you, uh, it's um, just a few thousand dollars, maybe a maybe hundred thousand dollars to stretch it. Uh, most labs have microscopes today. Uh, I know Boet has, Dhaka University has. Um, so, to add to this, maybe, you know, you need to have some facilities, of course, but they're very, very cheap. Uh, so, if Bangladesh wants to proceed in <coughs> new science, advanced science, the investment is very small. Bangladesh can easily afford it. And most universities, private or public, can easily afford it. It's not a problem at all. How it's going to help Bangladesh, I think Bangladesh is advancing rapidly in manufacturing drugs. Uh, so, this, these machines are very useful in drug testing. So, toxicity effects of the drugs. Um, as well as, you know, um, individualized medicine that we are talking here in the, in the United States. Like what drug is good for an individual? Drugs are made for large scale, but there could be much more uh, individualized medications. So we don't have a good way to testing that this drug is good for this patient. Uh, that's where these machines could be very, very powerful. And Bangladesh can contribute significantly. <coughs> that is an impressive amount of insight. But moving on, could you expand on your journey from Buit to Illinois and how it has affected your now international standing and recognition as a leading engineer in your subject? Yeah, uh, I mean, big part that I reflect on is, is the coincidences of events. Uh, so the fact that I got into bio is through this colleague who came and the option could be I could say oh, I don't want to work on this my I'm working on physical science uh, sensors uh, so taking advantage of an opportunity is probably uh, a key factor so uh, when I went to into the biosystems you know maybe a two or three years later I came across with another colleague of mine over a cup of coffee and he said you know in, I'm working on neurons in the brain and I find uh, that uh, there is something in the neurons that I don't understand. Uh, neurons seem to be um, seem to be doing something like the muscles do. So I got excited about it, and I spent some time with him, and he found out that yeah, there's a lot to do in neuroscience. Uh, so all along my journey, I found that you would always have challenges, difficulties. Um, but uh, it's but there are also very many many opportunities that come by. Uh, so the challenges, of course, we have to overcome, uh, but also to take advantage of the opportunities with excitement, with some belief in it. So during my journey through PhD, um, I had difficulties in um, in finishing up a project, and I had to change the department. Um, so there were there are lots of issues that were quite difficult at that time, um, and I had I didn't have funding, so I had to go from one department to the other to do teaching assistantship. And as you know, in the U.S., uh, it, it's very very expensive, so I, I couldn't afford it. So and I didn't have any financial aid, so I had to go from math department to physics department, <coughs> mechanical engineering. Can I can I do some work for you? Can you support my education and they always came up you know somebody always came up and said oh you can you can teach this course we'll pay your tuition 
um, very difficult times. Uh, but somehow there is always someone who, who comes and provides us support. Uh, so that's how you know I kind of survived on the long. So do you have any advice for aspiring Bangladeshi students who would see you as an example to aspire towards, but have a perceived uh, limitation in either financial or um, uh, in their opportunities? How would you advise them? Would you, would you say that despite whatever humble beginnings they have, that they can still achieve what you have achieved? Yeah, I, I think... Um for the young people, believing in something is probably most important. So, if you, for example, if you want to become a doctor, um, and if you if you very strongly feel that I may have difficulties, maybe difficulties in getting into medical school, uh, medical colleges, um, don't give up. If you really believe in it, you try to find people who could help you. And you will be surprised that if you really believe in it and if you really work very hard towards it, and I don't know what work one needs to do to achieve a certain goal, a certain dream, but if you really spend all your energy into it and believing in it, you will find there are always supports on your way. This is surprising. You know, uh, there is a famous book, uh, uh, I think the writer is uh, uh, Coelho. Um, he says that if you really want something, the whole universe conspires to help you out. Um, so if you really want something, if you believe in it uh, as a dream, um, and you put all your heart and soul into it, uh, it's amazing how you will find the support show up. Uh, the challenge is, you know, the first time, the second time, if things do not work out, you feel like giving up. Um, I think that's the trap. And the way to avoid falling into this trap is try one more time. And that's how I think um, we, we as human beings, we can achieve a lot, much more than we can <coughs> imagine. We always tend to feel it's not possible. Oh, I didn't, I didn't get this one, so I'm not good enough. Uh, I think that's a trap that we need to guard against. Uh, so if you strongly believe in achieving a dream, then it's easier to overcome. You can, you can overlook the failures uh, and then stick on to little successes along the way. Uh, and that always takes you to the next step. That's very inspiring to hear, Professor. However, there are some realities that we must acknowledge. For example, as a Bangladeshi, have you ever faced any or encountered any difficulties um, in your career that were not faced by those who do not belong to perceived minority groups? In the U.S., I felt... Uh, actually, I didn't face something that I can identify as um, discriminated as a minority. Um, but at the same time, as I mentioned to you, is that uh, I think um, anybody has to be, um, has to put all their heart and soul. And you need to be better than the average, that's for sure. Um, whether, um, I don't want to brag or anything, but if, if um, I, 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 I think I had to be better than many others to take the next step. Uh, I didn't work hard because I, I felt myself as minority. I just thought this is exciting, this is interesting, so I should put all my heart and soul into it. Um, so people would have no choice but to accept me. That is very but inspiring. Reality, yeah. But, it, but you raise a very good point, very, very good point. I don't want to uh, belittle the point. Uh, there are difficulties, there are realities. And in a sense, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. Uh, I'm now in the National Academy. I know there are many other people who are as good or better than me uh, who could have been in the National Academy. 
but again, it's a coincidence of many, many luck. I think believe in something, maybe for some the luck helps, maybe for some the luck doesn't help. But one thing is true, that if one doesn't try, no matter how lucky you are, it's not going to work. Very interesting. Speaking of the National Academy of Engineering, I am to understand that there was actually quite an interesting story of how you found out about your entrance into that prestigious uh, sector. Would you care to share it with the audience? Yeah, sure, sure. So, you know, these things are kept very confidential. And, and I, I, you know, my professor was Professor Jamil Reza Choudhury in, in Buet, and I used to see him every year and talk to him quite often. And um, for the last few years before he passed away, he would tell me, when would you be in National Academy? And I would think that uh, Sir Jamil Sir was maybe overrating me. <laughs> I never thought of that, you know, I, I, it, it was so high up there, I didn't even worry. But when I was, but something was going on, of course, uh, somebody must have nominated me and all the process had to go through. But I was teaching in a class that was um, February 6th, I think. And it's a big class and uh, the Dean of Engineering, uh, Professor Rashid Bashir called me and the ring phone was ringing. And I thought his Dean is calling, so you need to have him in the class, I should pick it up. I mean, he's been ringing for so long. And he said, I want to uh, tell you something, but I said, I'm, I'm teaching. And he said, oh, even better, I would like to talk to the students. Uh, I was teaching using uh, a microphone, he's a big class, and he then announced to the students. So, uh, so I, uh, that was the first, uh, first phone call I received, uh, the dean calling, and so I went downstairs after the class. Uh, of course, I had to continue the class and finish the class, and then, uh, and then I found out, yeah, it was true. Uh, so they announced it, I think, 2 p.m. Eastern New York Times, uh, and I was teaching at that time. Uh, so he got the news. Um, while I was teaching. So your so students heard it at the same time as you? That's right. That's too, yeah. I'm sure so they must the have been very happy. <laughs> yeah, the students were very happy. And then uh, this is undergraduate students, third year mechanical engineering students. So they were, they were very happy. Can you share any memorable moments or breakthroughs you had during your career? Oh, there are so many. Uh, <laughs> maybe I share something that uh, that uh, that kept me up <laughs> all night. Uh, so, you know, uh, one, one time my student was studying very, very small scale metals. And um, so if you think about a metal paper clip, for example, so if you, if you bend the paper clip, you know it's remained bent, right? Uh, so think about an experiment it, like an analog so that people can understand. So it's like my student bend the paper clip and then next day he comes back and he sees the paper clip is back again where it came from. And so I thought the student must be very tired and he must be hallucinating. And I told him, go home, get some rest. And so he goes home, he comes back, and he says, uh, Professor, I did the experiment again. And again, I see the paper clip is back. And it was the most uh, surprising result. So that student was uh, Aman Hawk from Bangladesh. I, uh, he was finishing up his PhD, and I told him, um, don't worry about it, finish your PhD. So I knew he had found something, but he didn't, I didn't want to spend another two years, two years of his life on this one. He should, by that time he has a job um, <coughs> as a faculty member. Then the new student came and he started to work on it. So that was a pivotal moment in my scientific career. Uh, we spent the next 10 years to understand what really happened wow. there. That is very interesting. So, so what role do you believe your research plays in solving global challenges in healthcare and sustainability? Yeah, yeah. So what I'm most excited and interested about now is uh, we have been doing some work for the last uh, three years or so. And what we found is that uh, when we exercise, 
and only three times a week if you walk 40 minutes a day very simple right people walk in the morning a uh, little bit fast walking so we knew for since the last 20 25 years uh, that if you do some physical exercise it's good for health we all know it's good of course. for health uh, we all know at least a little bit that it's also good for mind uh, which means that you know your mental health is better but people didn't know why uh, about uh, maybe 10 15 years ago people found that when people up to the age of 65 they walk three times a week 40 minutes a day their uh, particular part of the brain size grows up so really? the brain size increases so after age of 50 or so the brain size starts to go down it's part of the brain called hippocampus, a pretty critical part of the brain that begins to shrink after the age of 50. So it goes down at 1.5% per vo of the volume per year. So as you know, we age, with aging, we tend to forget um, natural brain aging. And then, um, of course, if we have a disease called dementia, depression, Alzheimer's disease, those things begin to show up. Uh, but if you walk, exercise, then not only the brain size does not go down in fact the brain size goes up which means that we there must be new cells in the brain they begin to appear so uh, what is making this happen begins to become a big question if we understand what did the exercise do just walking so that the brain size goes up as if like we are reborn again new neurons are appearing. These new neurons are like newborn neurons in the hippocampus. Then we might think of particular dosage of exercise at different ages that will prevent the aging, that will prevent the mental disease that we have with aging, including Alzheimer's disease and many other mental diseases. Uh, so we started to work on it and we now begin to see what is the connection between exercise, which is which involves the muscles, and how that helps the brain to add new neurons to the hippocampus? So why is this important? So as you know, the people are living longer and longer. So in Bangladesh, in 1960, the, uh, the age limit was about 44 or so, maybe 43, 44. Uh, now it's about 70, 72, and it's linearly increasing per year. Uh, all over the world, any region of the world, it's linearly increasing from 1960s. And it has not plateaued. Maybe in 30, 40 years, people will live 100 years. I'm sure you know your grandparents or many friends, they, they live in 80, 80, 90 years these days, hmm. which is a good thing. But then the problem is the brain aging does not stop. So from 50, as I mentioned, 50 and beyond, the brain size goes down. So then, yes, we are living longer and longer because you know we have we have antibiotics to stop from infection. We have many other medications that make us life long, live longer. But we are living longer with mental diseases. So if we do exercise then maybe we can live better. So to me, one of the grand challenge for the humanity today, by far more than many other challenges that we talk about, including environment, including global warming, which we can address by driving less cars or flying less, but aging we cannot stop because we want to live longer. So the grand challenge that we have, which is we cannot fix, is our living longer. So if exercise can help improve our mental health or fight against the aging, hmm. then I think our long living, uh, we can live with a better life. Not only that, as people age, who helps them? You know, your grandparents, your, your parents, people in the family have to help them. Yeah. Uh, so this large group of people who has to carry the weight of the aging population, 
could be helped by having exercise all along the life. Yes. My job would be to understand the science behind this exercise in the muscle. How does it increase the brain volume? Interesting. That's very insightful. Now, I have another question for you. Now that you've reached a peak in, scholar, in scholarly engineering, what's next? Should we expect a Nobel Prize under your name in a few years? Oh, no, engineering has no, no Nobel Prize. But I'm sure uh, your work will be worthy of some further achievements. Uh, that, um, I, Almighty knows more. Uh, my job is to be excited about the science uh, and do whatever I can do for the humanity. And it's clear you are. So, a few last questions. Reflecting on your experiences, what's one piece of advice that you would give to, you, to yourself as a younger man or to students today who are looking to you as an, as an inspiration? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, I think the most important thing is to believe in a dream. Believe in something that you want to achieve. And this dream, uh, for some people, it starts when they're in high school, like, like you know, intermediate stage. For some, it may come when they're at the age of 40. Uh, but believing in something, having a dream, I think is most important because that takes you away from other distractions of life. Uh, if you really believe, if you believe in, you know, having uh, joining an NGO to help poor in the neighborhood, that's, you excel in it. If you believe in discovery, you know, find your way towards the dream. Uh, right. So having this dream takes you out from depression uh, and all the other anxieties. But dream also comes with a challenge because you mentioned the realities. So it's the it's a conflict between the dream and the reality that prevents you from achieving the dream. The stronger you believe in the dream, the easier it becomes to tackle the realities. Excellent. And on those inspiring words, it's time to draw this uh, interview to a conclusion. Thank you again. Many thanks for joining us today. I'm sure that your knowledge and your experiences will inspire many, many more to follow in your footsteps. Thank you so much, you so much, Professor Saif. I really am thankful that you have been here. I wish you the best day. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. Thank you. And with that, this has been Bangladesh Beyond the Borders. I have been Asa Zapata. And thank you all so much for watching us. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.